Outside forces can be uh, mechanical, just by shearing. They can be electric fields, magnetic fields, and so on. <coughs> Soft matter uh, has very small elastic constants, uh, not like steel or things like that, but much, much, much smaller, orders of magnitude smaller. And it's Predominant physical behavior occurs at energies uh, that are comparable to the thermal energy at room temperature. Okay, so some examples for soft matter are liquid <coughs> crystals, which we're going to talk about in a bit more detail later on, uh, polymers, colloids, um, and these are, in fact, these. These are, this is a liquid crystal. That's part of a polymer. These are colloids. Uh, foams, gels, um, granular material like sand piles. Easily deformable. You just kick it in, it deforms. Um, a variety of biological materials. And uh, what's called complex fluids, which is basically a combination of these. Right, so uh, soft matter uh, in general um, has received its Nobel Prize in 1991. So um, there's no more chance for me now. Uh, they don't happen in the. Uh, they don't give them out um, to the same topic that easily. But uh, it's been given out to Pierre de Gen, who um, works as the liquid crystal man, and they show uh, one of the, the old liquid crystal watches there. Uh, he was actually a fairly theoretically working person. He never touched anything. Uh, he never made an experiment. But uh, he did uh, some very, very good theory, and um, his book is, is uh, still one of the Bibles of uh, liquid crystal science. He also worked on, on polymers and uh, later on biological matter and so on. And I'm quite sure that the Swedish king didn't have a clue what he was listening to when he... Uh, <laughs> I had to listen to the Jean uh, during his Nobel Prize acceptance speech. Um, so, yeah, so that was the, the Nobel Prize for, for soft matter or liquid crystals. 
So, the first thing we're going to talk about are liquid crystals. We're going to talk about three categories here, liquid crystals, polymers, and colloids. Because uh, you find those everywhere in life, and that gives you a better relation to these kind of materials. Okay, so liquid crystals. What are liquid crystals? Uh, they have been discovered actually quite a while ago. Um, 125 <coughs> years or something like that ago. By an Austrian botanist. He looks very Austrian, doesn't he? Uh, who was chopping up carrots to isolate compounds like these. That's a, some kind of cholesterol compound. <clears throat> and he observed that um, he had a substance that showed two melting points. So you know, normal substances like water, you heat it up, it goes from ice <coughs> to water, one melting point. These have two melting points. So what he actually observed was uh, he went from a crystalline or a crystal state to a liquid crystal to a normal liquid, right? And um, it did need a physicist, Otto Lehmann, who, to realize this already one year later. And he actually coined the term liquid crystal. And, uh, well, I'm sure you know liquid crystals from all sorts of applications like um, yeah, uh, pocket calculators, uh, wrist watches. These by now seem to be retro, I guess. Uh, when I was your age, I actually was one of the first people to have one of these, and I was quite a quite a stir at our street. You walk around. Like this. <laughs> um, Okay, this is the, uh, the very first prototype of a liquid crystal display. And, well, you know it also from, obviously, uh, computer monitors, laptop screens. Um, well, and that's one big flat panel TV there. Uh, your smartphones um, are most likely having liquid crystal displays. And so liquid crystals have found their way into the uh, consumer market uh, quite rapidly once they had solved all the problems of the uh, switching and the sealing of the cell and so on. Right, uh, the much lesser known fact is that there is uh, quite a lot more liquid crystals. Like, um, if you add water to detergents, you get a liquid crystal phase. If you uh, look at foam films, they are very similar to, um, to, to these kinds of structures, the ordered structures or cell membranes. These are all liquid crystalline. So, uh, quite a lot of... Um, your mass is actually made up of liquid crystals. But not the liquid crystals that you find in this place. <coughs> okay, so detergents, cell phones, cell membranes, and so on. These are uh, also liquid crystalline materials. And, uh, yeah, so what are liquid crystals? There are materials that are between the three-dimensionally ordered crystal and the unordered liquid, right? So in between, there are partially ordered states, and these are called liquid crystal states. And there's quite a lot of them, actually. And um, in, a, in a thermodynamic sense, uh, liquid crystals are actually the fourth state of matter. Despite the fact that plasma physicists always uh, pretend that a plasma is a fourth state of matter, it is actually the liquid crystals that are. So, um, yeah, so 
had as a liquid crystal look. Right, so this is a bottle of liquid crystal. And uh, I'm going to give that a round, but please don't drop it. Because th this is enough for several thousand mobile phone displays. So, don't drop it. <laughs> so that's a liquid crystal, and you can see that uh, because it's, a, it's not like water. It's not a clear liquid. <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> well, you have to make bubbles as well. Uh, okay, so uh, we can give those around. And so what happens is, if you uh, look at your liquid crystal, there are two types. They are what is called the thermotrophic liquid crystal. These uh, come about through a change in temperature. And there's a lyotropic liquid crystal. These come about by changing the concentration of certain molecules in a solvent, right? So these would be detergents and so on. And these would be the ones that you find in applications like laptop displays and so on. And <coughs> liquid crystals do have uh, an anisotropic shape. So that the molecules are not like spheres or something, they're elongated cigar-like molecules. Uh, so here we have the, the physicist's view of a liquid crystal, like a cigar. Um, this is the chemist's view of a liquid crystal. And this is one that's called 5CB, which was actually produced uh, first in the UK and uh, sort of was the first liquid crystal at room temperature and that sort of kicked off the whole business of of, uh, of displays and so on. Right, so these molecules they have a polarizable core and they have floppy chains at the side to give them some kind of flexibility. Okay, so the anisotropy of the molecules and the fact that they orient more or less parallel to each other leads to anisotropic physical properties. So uh, things like the refractive index depend on the direction you're looking. And uh, so that leads to, to birefringence, for example but also to a dielectric anisotropy, which you need for switching the liquid crystal by applying the voltage, uh, or different conductivity, viscosity, magnetic susceptibility, and so on, um, which are usually different from the direction along the molecular axis and perpendicular to it. Okay, so let's see if we can See like a crystal. Now we need this. <coughs> Not much to see is that. Okay. So polarizers. You all know how those work, I guess. All right? So if you have them parallel, they transmit light. If you have them perpendicular, they don't. Now, if we put a birefringent material in the middle, then um, you would expect uh, some kind of birefringence, right? Because so there would be an ordinary and an extraordinary beam. They travel at different speeds, and they combine and, and form elliptically polarized light. So that's a birefringent crystal. And you can actually see this. Right, so it changes the polarization the state of light, and we can see the the birefringence. So let's see if we can do the same thing with the liquid crystal, which is a bit more complicated because we are actually uh, talking about a liquid. So 
we can uh, just put a piece of glass here. We have our liquid crystal. And we put a bit of that onto the glass. Okay, and we can put a cover slip on it, just so that it doesn't go away. And you can't see it, of course, not because you're missing the second polarizer, right? So if you put the second polarizer in there. You actually see. <laughs> That's a one pixel display. Right? And you can see that it flows when you press on it a little bit. You see that it flows. Right? You see? Okay. So, liquid crystals are an isotropic. Right, so uh, you can easily see this in a microscope by just cooling from the normal liquid and reducing the temperature. And if you do that, you see that a liquid crystal phase grows. So everything that's bright is the liquid crystal, everything that's dark is a normal liquid. Yeah? And actually, from the texture of these things, we can identify how, what kind of face we're looking at. Because there is actually a zoo of different little crystal phases, about 25 different ones. And they all differ by their degree of order. And you can see this here. This is called an nematic liquid crystal. That's the one that's in, in all of your applications. Um, so you have all the, the long axes of the molecules pointing in one, more or less one direction, whereas the centers of mass are isotropically oriented. But you can have a one-dimensional positional order as well, like, like layers here, and the orientational order in one direction. And then you have what is called smectics, and they're, they're called smectics from the Greek word of soap, which is something like smectic. <laughs> and uh, you can see that if you uh, take your, your liquid crystal and you put it on your finger and go like this, it feels like, like a soap foam. And then you can have all sorts of different order of, of your liquid crystal. Uh, which leads them to something of around 25 different phases. Okay, <coughs> and we can distinguish these phases by, uh, yeah, looking at them in polarizing microscopy, and they have rather distinct textures. Like the nematic, for example, has these, these point defects that you can see. Um, smectic phases often have what is called a, a fan-shaped texture, so they're, they're sort of like, like fans. And from these we can identify what kind of liquid phase we're looking at. And then they become progressively more complicated and then we need other methods as well, like... Um, did I just kill that one? Or? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Um, so X-ray diffraction, things like that, which then of course tell you about the structure as well. And then we can introduce something. Uh, you know what chirality is? No. You all know that. No. 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 Una, una. Right. 
That's the left-handed glove. Try putting it on your right hand. Then you know what parallel is. <laughs> So that doesn't, doesn't work, right? So it's handedness. It's image and mirror image. So if you have molecules that are mirror images of each other, they're called chiral. Right? And now I go for an interesting... They're interesting... Um, effects there, I mean, if you, you know, the molecule that gives you the, the smell of lemon, uh, the mirror image of that molecule is <coughs> the smell of orange, for example. So, but we can do the same thing with liquid crystals, and we uh, make molecules that we can, oops, that we cannot superimpose on each other uh, by translation or rotation, just by mirror symmetry. And then we get to phases that are only observed for chiral molecules. <coughs> and these are called, uh, for example, the blue. The blue phases. While blue phases does not have to be blue, they can be green or red. You know why? <coughs> <laughs> um, no, if you think of a cube, it depends on what direction you're looking. You can look along diagonal and so on. And that gives you different colors. So it's like 3D polaroid. Hmm? So it's sort of like 3D polaroid. Um, yeah, it's a photonic crystal, actually. <laughs> <laughs> So this is how our blue faces look like. They're made up of uh, cylinders for the twist, and they orient perpendicular to each other. And you cannot orient uh, three of such cylinders without introducing a defect. And if you do introduce a defect, this lattice will be a cubic lattice of defects. Uh, other complicated faces are sort of twist grain boundary phases which uh, look like this and the uh, <coughs> best one of course the one that we can use is the um, cholesteric liquid crystal so it's like the pneumatic phase just all out of chiral molecules and that makes a helical structure yeah, sort of a spiral structure, which can be left-handed or right-handed. <coughs> and that reflects light with circular polarization. So, uh, that has use in, in a number of different applications. Uh, medical thermography, for example. Uh, they smear your back full of a cholesterol liquid crystal and wherever you have a inflammation or a tumor or something, it's warmer than in other places. And uh, the reflected color depends on the pitch of the spiral and that changes with temperature. All right? Um, you can also use it um, for pretty cool cars. You can uh, make paint out of it and uh, the car will have a different color uh, once you, you look at it when it comes towards you and then it's beside you it will have a different color and then it changes color again. And there's at least one car like that running around here in Manchester. I've seen it. <laughs> Um, it's also, of course, used uh, in fiction. So, for you guys. So, if you put that on, yeah, I want it. Um, 
So if you if you have these things, they're called mood rings. Right? So they change color as well when you put them on. And the color tells you if you're in a good mood or in a bad mood. So red is a good mood, blue is a bad mood. I'm sorry? Yeah. Oh, uh, yes, we can. You can apply electric fields and change the wavelength. No, well, they, they're not very stable. Okay, guys. Uh, other applications uh, which might be more interesting for us. Are you allowed lipstick? Not in school. <laughs> there you go. And then it changes color and so on. Okay, so that's the application of polysterics. Um, there's some some beetles that do all of this by themselves, and uh, they actually make a helical structure on their back, which reflects circular polarized light. And how would you find that out if the light is circular polarized? <clears> oh, <throat> uh, you can take a polarizer. Where do you get a circular polarizer from? No, no, no. What you do? Well, you can use a linear polarizer and uh, and a wave plate and of 45 degrees and so on, it's a bit complicated. Or you can go to the movie and get those glasses. I mean, they might not make you pretty, but, um, but one of these uh, glasses is, is left-handed circular polarized, the other one is right-handed if you look either with your left or your right eye onto these beetles they appear colored or dark right? yeah so uh, when you view the the the, the beetle uh, with a left circular polarizer, it appears bright. With a right circular polarizer, you obviously absorb the left circular polarized light and, uh, and it appears black. Okay, um, well, what else can we do with liquid crystals? You said you, you do astronomy talks here as well. We can do astronomy in the lab. So what we do is we look at these kinds of things. That's the uh, the defects that I told you before, point defects. And if you look at them, they should be. Why doesn't the children do this? Do they move like plants? Hmm? Do they move like plants? No, they uh, attract each other and disappear. Um, have you got the final save on the I actually have, oh, yes. You get some Well, in any case, uh, what should happen is that. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's all in the <laughs> Well, there should be some kind of quotes in here to hold But I don't know how to do it. So, I don't think it's fine. But what should happen is that, uh, what should happen is uh, that, that these uh, two different defects, uh, there's a force between them, and they attract each other and they disappear. 
and um, and this is called the Kibble Zurich mechanism. Uh, there was a guy called Kibble. He said that at the very early universe, the uh, universe went through phase transitions where defects were formed and then disappeared. And this is exactly what happens in liquid systems. Let's see if that will be works. Anyway, um, there's defects forming and defects disappearing and leaving uniform structures. And this is described by a very simple number, one half. So if you plot the defect density as a function of how quickly you introduce these defects, there should be a, uh, in a, in a double logarithmic plot, you have a straight line with slope one half. That's what the prediction is. And indeed, this actually does say one half. Um, so you can confirm uh, cosmological theories uh, with liquid crystals. Okay, so polymers. What are polymers? Well, Small molecules are called monomers. If you take a lot of them uh, together and uh, add them up, you end up with a polymer. And these can be polymers of the same building blocks, of uh, varying building blocks. They can be statistical, uh, statistically distributed, or they can form blocks. These are called block copolymers. You can have uh, linear chains, branch chains, you can cross-link polymers, all of these different things you can do. And um, <coughs> the, uh, the way to do this is you take a number of these monomers, you polymerize them into a chain, and you have PVC, which is a polymer. Okay, so again, you can find polymers all around you. Um, they're used in biology to carry information. That would be the double helix of DNA. Um, as catalysts and enzymes, food reserves, uh, starch is a, is a polymer. Or as car carriers uh, in, in Energy transport, which is hemoglobin. Let's see here. Uh, you find polymers in nature. Wood is a good example. These are cellulose molecules, like these ones here. And they're basically uh, very similar to sugar, actually. Or wool, which is very similar to your hair you like it or not, but it is. Um, and there are, of course, synthetic polymers, uh, fibers, plastics, rubber, and so on. So, natural rubber. What do you think? How much do we produce of this per year? A billion tons. Uh, not, not quite, but uh, 12 million. Well, what about synthetic rubber? How much? Six million. Nearly. Uh, synthetic fibers. Two million. Okay. Twenty. Thirty-five. That was actually quite close. Cotton. How much cotton is produced? 
There's actually more synthetic fibers we use than natural ones. Silk. One million. One million. So, what about paper? Seventy-five million. What do you think? <laughs> we do use some a lot We do use some quite a lot of paper. Okay, so there's some some interesting industrial polymers. Uh, pretty sure you know what the first one is. That's nylon. What do you think the second one is? Is that Not super good. <laughs> okay, so there are some others. Uh, the ones that you. Uh, polystyrene, for example, where you get your food in. Um, took about a hundred years for them to actually use it after discovery. The same with uh, PVC or polyvinyl chloride. Uh, took about a hundred years. Uh, polyethylene, plastic bags and things, was quite a lot faster. And um, what else do we have? Polyethylene terephthalate. PET bottles, for example. Apparently, they were uh, invented here in Manchester. <laughs> Not that I knew that before, but uh, apparently it was. So, there are some interesting behaviors of polymers, and one of them is the, um, the glass transition. So, uh, Oftentimes materials don't crystallize when you lower their temperature, but they form a glass. And a glass is a supercooled liquid. Right? So there's no structure to a glass, but it's 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 hard anyway. Right? And that happens when molecular processes are slower than the cooling rate. And at that point you find uh, a dramatic increase of the viscosity and elasticity and examples are for example polymer glasses um, take a plastic bag and put it into your freezer you will see that the properties are very much different than they are at room temperature um, the inorganic glasses what is this silicon dioxide yeah, <laughs> that's basically uh, what, what our windows are made of. Um, there are other things like obsidian. Anyone seen that before? So that's how obsidian looks like. So it certainly doesn't look like crystal. And uh, same thing um, with uh, meat. some meteors can, can form glasses because they get very hot and then are cooled very quickly. Um, anyone seen a meteor before? <laughs> okay, and, and for example, you can even make uh, gla uh, glasses out of, out of metal. But you have to cool them really, really quickly. 10 to 8 Kelvin per second. I don't know. I have no idea uh, how you do that. But they, they, they do exist. Okay, so 
Another interesting property that uh, polymers have is viscoelastic behavior. So they, they show some viscosity and at the same time elastic behavior. Right? So they have uh, irreversible deformations for long force applications, for, for slow long force application. And that is of course viscous then, and they have elastic deformations for short force applications. And we can model these things, for example, by, uh, by a spring, which models the elasticity, and a dashboard, which models the, uh, the viscosity. So, we can try this experiment. So if I do this slowly, there's an elastic deformation, right? And there's a certain viscosity. And if I do this a bit more quickly, uh, there should be elasticity, right? So that works pretty well. <laughs> and at the same time, if you do it slowly, it's called Crazy Aaron's Thinking. Great stuff. So, you can deform it, you can stretch it, you can bounce it. If you take a piece and hammer it, then it will actually uh, just, just scatter. Yeah. No, that's a business behavior. Yeah, but very slowly. And if you lie on it for a long time, it won't. Okay, but there are also liquid crystalline polymers. And uh, many of these uh, are, are natural, not all of them. We can make, uh, we can make polymers out of um, liquid crystals. But uh, one of the nice ones is actually spider silk. Spider silk is a fascinating material, actually. And it forms when, uh, well, spiders secrete silk proteins from uh, their glands. And this is uh, in a water-based solution, they're pushing out the water of the solution and the solution through these glands. They get oriented polymer chains, and that means that they get uh, very uh, high tensile strength. And uh, spider silk, for example, is uh, about five times stronger than steel. And at the same time, uh, you can make uh, fabrics of it. So you can... No, no, they, these are worn. Uh, hmm? Yeah, but you can break the spider work, but... I mean, if you look at how thin this thing is... Yeah, yeah, well, it's not an absolute value. Yes. Um, another one is Kevlar. You know what Kevlar is? Does anyone have Kevlar? No? Well, that's a... That, that's Kevlar, that's a man-made. So this is out of a liquid crystal. So that's a man-made fiber. And you can try to rip it apart. Uh, I doubt that it will work. Um, you find them in, in gloves, for example. So you can, you can make fabrics of Kevlar. And at the same time, you cannot cut through. Should we give that a try? You wear the glove, I take the knife. <laughs> <laughs> no? 
Okay, it's also used in, uh, in bulletproof vests uh, for, for climbing gear and so on. And uh, it's also fire repellent, so uh, firemen wear this, uh, wear, wear Kevlar uh, as well. So, third part, colloids. What are colloids? Well, colloids are basically everything that is smaller than about 10 microns and larger than a nanometer. Right? That can be little spheres like this, uh, which can be made by, by polymerization from a solution. They can be nanowires like this. Uh, you can even crystallize them. So if you're good, you can, can crystallize these colloidal particles. And um, they are very soft because, uh, first of all, they're metastable, so they are in a, in a local minimum of their potential, but, uh, but not in a global minimum. Their uh, physical properties, especially those of interactions with light, depend on the particle size. And we know that, for example, from uh, from opals. It's precious. Well, it's not really a stone. It's called a precious stone. Right. So uh, these things make photonic crystals. Right. But some more hands-on examples of colloids. Milk is a colloid because you have little spheres of fat swimming around in water. That's why skimmed milk looks blue and not white. Uh, because this is a question of light scattering. Right? So milk looks white because the light is scattered at the little uh, drops of fat. If you take out the fat, then there's less and less scattering. And uh, skimmed milk that looks sort of bluish. Um, toothpaste is a dispersion colloid. Um, paint is is you have very small particles, uh, colored particles in a suspension. Um, cigarette smoke. Of course, I'm, I'm sure none of you smoke. Um, but fog, for example, is a dispersion colloid. It's water droplets in a uh, in a gas environment. Okay, so there's all sorts of different ones, which have different names, and here are some examples. Has anyone ever seen an aerogel? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, during the talk that I gave at your school. <laughs> I'm not coming to your school. <laughs> okay, so this, this is an aerogel. Well, it's two pieces of paper, but the aerogel is in between, which is mainly nothing. <laughs> it's mainly air with very, very small amounts of a solid. And uh, nevertheless, it has uh, quite fascinating properties. Um, if you look at this example here, for example, you have a two and a half kilogram brick, which is supported by two grams of an aerogel. The aerogel is down here. Uh, it's a very poor heat conductor, so you just heat an aerogel up, and uh, it, it doesn't really conduct heat. Um, they, they are really, really light, so you can um, drop them on plants, nothing happens. And, uh, yeah, this is how they sort of look like. And aerogels were developed by uh, by NASA to uh, actually collect dust from from comets. So they were sending their probe 
through the uh, the tail of a comet and collected dust in these aerogels and then brought them back to Earth somehow. Okay, and what else do we have? Uh, gels. A hydrogel is uh, something that is uh, interconnected and, uh, and, and water added. And you can see that from a very small amount of hydrogel, if you add water, you have a lot of swelling. So they can swell to several hundred percent of their size. They also have quite interesting properties. If you take them like this, nothing happens, right? If you apply a force, then you can see that it quite easily moves. So that's an, an arrow gel. And, well, applications of aerogels you find in uh, wound dressing, in contact lenses, uh, something for you, uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, that there is an important part of, uh, of the polymer gels and uh, <laughs> gummy bears. So gummy bears are polymer gels. And there's another type of of, uh, of colloids. These are called association colloids, where you have amphiphilic molecules. Those are the ones that uh, have a, a uh, hydrophobic tail groups and hydrophilic heads, and. Uh, they can sort of clump together, that's how washing actually works. Because detergents are made of, of um, amphibolic molecules. So they would collect the dirt particles in here, and then you can wash them out with, with uh, water. But they can also make little crystal phases. And that's where you have to be careful. If you take too much detergent and form a little crystal phase in your washing machine, uh, you will never get it out anymore. <laughs> so you have to sort of be in this regime here for the washing. So, well, if you go to this regime where you have single molecules floating around, nothing will happen, the dirt will stay in. If you come to this regime, you will have to make a crystal phase and need to get a new regime. And I don't know why I have this picture here. But he doesn't seem to have done this too often. So I, I don't remember why I have this in there. So, uh, well, I hope you have a little insight into what um, soft matter is and um, what liquid crystal polymers, colloids and other soft matter is. And if you have any questions, go ahead. Well, in a thermodynamic sense, yes, because there are real phase transitions. 